Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another Sooth Keep live stream. Um, as always, please give me thumbs up if you guys can see us and hear us. Uh, right now, I see nobody in the room, so I'm not sure exactly what is going on. Okay, we have thumbs up, so people are hearing. So apparently, the the um, head count. Um, apparatus is not working very well. All right. Now, tonight we've got a, a guest on that most of you are probably not going to be familiar with, and some of you are. His name is Dustin Rip, uh, originally from Wisconsin. He is now in the state of Tennessee. His social media handles are The Ripster and Busy for the Lord. Now, maybe some of you have seen his Busy for the Lord YouTube channel or his. Uh, Rumble channel. He's definitely worth looking into. He's definitely worth subscribing to. Uh, one of the things he does that some people don't do anymore is do some short videos in the five to 15 minute range that cover subjects. That's a tremendous blessing in a ministry, especially for busy people. So um, bear that in mind. Busy for the Lord. Four is just the le the number four. Busy for the Lord, one word. You should be able to find his YouTube channel. And on other social media like Telegram, he's the Ripster. Just type in Ripster with two Ps and you will find his Telegram channel. Well, I do have a little bit of housekeeping before we move into the program tonight, folks. Um, but before we move into the housekeeping, I do want to introduce Dustin. So Dustin, welcome aboard. Welcome to the Sooth Keep live stream. Hey, praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. A blessing to be here tonight. All right. Now, I want you to pray for me, folks. I've, I'm going to, Sask to Saskatchewan here this coming weekend. I'm going to be in a small town called Frontier. Believe it or not, I'm going to be preaching in a small uh, Lutheran church that's very evangelical and that loves Bible prophecy going to be a great time. I'll be preaching Saturday evening, this coming Saturday at 7 p.m. I'll be giving my testimony. Sunday morning, I'll be preaching at 9.30 and 10.30. I'll be covering Israel's past, present, and future, and I'll be covering the message of heaven. And then also pray that I, I've got a really busy schedule coming up this spring with two gigantic one-month-long road trips, one to Florida and back and one that will be going down to Oklahoma and then over to Colorado and back to Oklahoma and then to California. So lots of driving, lots of stops. One thing I do want to say, you probably noticed that we had some not-so-cool lounge music with a 30-second countdown today. I'm still having trouble with my introductory, uh, my two-minute introductory clip I thought we had that problem resolved. I still get hit every time with with uh, with warnings over the thing. I get hit with copyright infringement reports. I've been working on this thing for two months. It's not going anywhere. So I'd like you to pray for this situation that God would fix this situation once and for all and forever. And also pray that I've been getting yellow flags on a, almost 50% of my live streams lately, so they're only partially monetized. Now, I don't really care that much about the, the monetization. It's nice, but it's not necessary. But the rub is uh, getting all these yellow flags. This means there's something going on that YouTube doesn't like. They're not really telling me what I'm doing wrong. It uh, seems to be no rhyme or reason to what videos get flagged and what don't. So just as an experiment, I'm taking my introductory clip out and see if that helps. At any rate, that's the, the um, housekeeping introduction. So, Dustin, let's get into the program. The first All thing right. I'd like to ask, Dustin, is if you would share your conversion testimony with with the audience what led to you coming up to the point of being converted uh how you were converted and what the lord did with you early on in your early stages of discipleship all right 
Well, um, some of you uh, that are in the chat room, I can see, um, have probably heard my testimony, but I'm going to go a little deeper tonight just for those who do not know me. Um, as Lee said, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I grew up as a Catholic, as a Roman Catholic. Now, you have uh, Catholics who are serious, and then you have your Catholics who are not so serious. Uh, I grew up in a family that had three nuns in, in the family, and so I went to Catholic school for the first six years. Uh, six uh, years of my life, and then went to public school. Um, and I was also an altar boy. So I was pretty serious as far as Catholicism, but I did not know the Lord. Okay. Um, so I was involved in, in sports growing up, baseball and football and, and, uh, into high school. So that kept me pretty busy. Also grew up on a dairy farm, uh, with my family. So we kept busy on the farm. Um, so what really happened was, uh, the, my life turned at the age of 19. So I had graduated high school. I was in my first year of technical college, um, but I had also been dealing with an addiction to um, marijuana and partying and all that stuff that you do in your first year of college or so what, so what I thought you were supposed to do, okay? So it was my 19th, it was gonna be my 19th birthday. This was October 18th, 2003. And I was around a group of guys, and we and they are all they were all getting around and talking about how it was going to be my birthday, and we should do something fun. And um, and they said, "Have have you ever tried hallucinogenic mushrooms?" And I said, "No," and I don't intend to. They're like, "Oh, it'll be really fun. You should try them. You should try them." So under peer pressure, I decided on my 19th birthday to try them. Long story short, I showed up the next day. All the guys that were there were not. I was around a couple of guys I did not really like or trust. Um, the majority of them had went to the Badger football game, which I love football. So I was kind of upset that they didn't take me to that for my birthday. So I ended up taking these, these hallucinogenic mushrooms. And um, I never had done any drugs like that that were that hard and didn't know what to really what to expect. But all I can tell you is that you know, I began to hallucinate and long story short, I found myself convinced that I was trapped in this realm that I could not get out of. So I began to freak out and panic. And I remember hearing voices in my head telling me that I was going to die. And now the place that I was at, the place where I was under the influence of these mushrooms, I was about five minutes from my family farm that I grew up in. I was in town, but it was about five minutes to the, the farm where I grew up in. So I said, I'm just gonna go drive home so I can feel safe. So I went and I got in my car and I never made it home. Um, I ended up crashing my car, but in the process of crashing my car, I ended up taking another man's life. He, he was jogging on the road that day. I woke up in the hospital, I was, I was handcuffed to a stretcher and a police officer was to the right of me and a detective was in my face. And as I began to come out of it, he's like, are you aware of what you did today? And I was like, yeah, I took some shrooms and it felt like I woke up from a bad dream. And he's like, he told me what, what had happened and that I was going to be going to jail after the hospital cleared me. And I was just like, this cannot be happening. So they took me to the jail. They put me in what they call the suicide cell because anything that traumatic happens, they usually put somebody in a cell to keep them safe. And I remember the lady come up and she asked me, is there anything I can get you? And, you know, being a Catholic, I never read the Bible, but I was like, can you give me a Bible? So she got me a Bible and I never read it that night, but I just remember it kind of, for some reason, I had to have that Bible in that, in that cell with me. So my parents ended up um, bailing me out. I spent about 10 months out uh, on bail. I was all over the local news, all over the local newspapers back in 2003. I was charged with OWI homicide under the influence of mushrooms. And I uh, was told by my attorney that my parents had hired to go back to school, to go back to work, just kind of live life as normal, if you will, until the sentencing date. Um, during that time, my grandpa had died. This was the same year that the Passion of the Christ movie came out. This is where I believe the Lord really began to call me. So as a Catholic, I thought I was a good person. Um, I thought I was on my way to heaven. But when I committed this crime, it was almost as if the Lord opened my eyes and said, you deserve hell. 
you deserve hell. And I just knew that I was, I was going to hell, but I didn't know how to be saved. So my grandpa had died, which had really got me thinking about life and death. Went to see the passion of the Christ and that whole, that whole movie kind of jogged me. And so that night I got down on my hands and knees and I said, Lord, I don't know what you have for me. I don't know how much prison time I'm going to face, but I just, you know, I just help me carry my cross. That's the best I could do as a Catholic, as far as praying to him, asking for help. So in August of 2004, I was sentenced by the judge to four and a half years in prison and four years probation, which um, is a lot more than I thought because I had no prior um, criminal background. I thought I was going to get maybe a year in uh, Huber work release, um, but that's what the Lord obviously gave me. So um, here I find myself uh, going to prison and it was January uh, 2004. Five, I'm in Chippewa prison, which is in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. It's a minimum custody prison. And my cellmate gives me a Bible and says, here, read this Bible. And he's like, are you Christian? I'm like, I'm Catholic. He's like, what does that mean? I'm like, well, I'm Catholic and I'm going to be Catholic to the day I die. You know, that proud Catholicism that I had. And he's like, what does that even mean? So he was the kind of the guy that Lord put in my path to challenge me and challenge my beliefs. And I started reading the Bible and I started attending the Bible studies that they would have in the chapel. And they kept talking about Jesus this and Jesus that and being saved. And I remember thinking to myself, what is what are they talking about? What about Mary? What about the Pope? And saved, isn't that kind of arrogant to say that you can be saved? Like, we don't know until the day of judgment, right? What is this born again talk? But through the Lord uh, using the, the volunteers that would come into the prison and preach and Bible study, he began to prepare my heart to, to be saved. So in May of 2005, I kind of understood what it meant to be saved. And I'll, I'll never forget it. I was on my bunk. All the rest of the guys in my pod were asleep. And I prayed and I said, Lord, forgive me for my sin. You know, take me to heaven. I want the gift of eternal life. Forgive me for all my, you know, everything. And I remember feeling the Lord's presence that night. I remember just feeling his love and feeling as if I'm forgiven. And so the, the, the rest of my four years that I, that I had to spend in prison, I, I often tell people I went to free Bible college, right? So I had every day to study the Bible. I would go down to the chapel and listen to teaching tapes, and I would get involved in our prayer groups, and I, would, I was a part of the church choir. I became the choir director, even though I couldn't sing because I had been there so long. And so I met a lot of brothers. I had... I had God had brought me to the point where I was able to start my own Bible study, have a separate room with guys, and the guard didn't care because it was a minimum custody prison. So it was just the way the Lord is working. And another side uh, story there, my, my family would come and visit me every once in a while. It was about a two-hour drive from where we grew up, where I grew up. And they would look at me like, what is the matter with you? And I'm like, I'm saved. I'm born again. And they all looked at me like, you can't know this. And I'm like, yes, you can. And, you know, as a new Christian, you're on fire and you just want to tell them why they're wrong. And I had to learn, OK, there's a way to go about this. And I, this is not working. They even sent the Catholic priest from my childhood parish up to talk to me. And I had made him so mad. He's like, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and I was just like, he's like, the Protestant Reformation is done. Like, it's there's no more fighting anymore. And I'm like. I, you know, just learning all this stuff about church history and Catholic church and this, that, and the other. And he was just upset when he left. And I just remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm definitely not a Catholic anymore. And so then I decided to leave the Catholic church and just start uh, joining a Protestant church. So I got out, I was released from prison in uh, November of 2008. I joined a church, did youth ministry uh, from 2009 to 2013. Um, I was involved in middle school and high school ministry, did that for a while, teaching small groups on Wednesday nights, going on retreats, stuff like that. Uh, in 2011, the Lord led me to uh, do uh, a blog ministry. I know, Lee, I'm probably probably jumping ahead to the ministry call, but it's, it's going to get to the YouTube thing. Uh, I, I started a blog called Ripster, ripsterforchrist.blogspot.com. And I did blog posts about apologetics and false teaching, everything you could think of that I learned in prison from 2011 to the present. 
I haven't really gotten to posting it, but you can go and check that out on my about section. And then I started my YouTube ministry in uh, 2021. So that's my testimony in a nutshell. Oh yeah. So now you have uh, your current um, busy for the Lord testimony on YouTube and you've got your other social media outlets, uh, telegram style things. That's the ripster. So what what is your vision? What are you trying to accomplish in your ministry here? Okay. So when the Lord led me to start the YouTube ministry, um, it was all over the whole 2020 thing. And, you know, I obviously can't say too much on YouTube, but I just felt this burning passion that, you know, people need to know about the rapture. People need to know that the Lord is coming. There's people seeking um, like-minded individuals that want to talk about end times theology, but they're not finding it in their local churches. There's so many people that are biblically illiterate when it comes to prophecy. You know, when I would discuss the rapture with my youth group or with any of the people in my local church, they just look at you like you have horns on your head. And I'm like, how do you not know this? This is our blessed hope. How are you not excited about this? Right, and right. Hard enough to find pastors that are bold enough to get behind the pulpit and actually preach on the rapture and a preacher of rapture. And we bounced from church to church just trying to find a guy that would preach on a preacher of rapture, let alone dispensationalism. So that was the vision to start my YouTube ministry was just to get out there and share all this knowledge that the Lord had downloaded into my brain when I was in prison for four and a half years and share it with people and find that like-minded remnant out there. And just to present the truth, to kind of get it out there. Um, and, you know, just having this understanding that the Lord was going to come back, is, is coming back soon. Mm, amen. Amen. The soon coming of the Lord has been something that's been a fire on my heart for many, many years. You know, I, I loved prophecy from the time I was first converted back in, uh, well, I was converted in 78, for the winter of 78, but it was probably in the summer of 19. 80 when I really got excited about prophecy when I was in the range of battalion and I was reading the Bible. Since then, prophecy has just been a burning fire. Now, I didn't get converted to the, the pre-tribulation rapture until somewhere around 1980, the fall of 1989. So I went about well, a good 10 years in the post-trib camp. But once my the eyes, my understanding were open to the pre-trib rapture, what a blessing it is to know that there's judgment coming on this world, and yet we get to be delivered before that time of judgment. Amen. Amen. So what's when you think about the, the pre-trib rapture and how best to communicate it, what's your favorite angle to approach the pre-trib rapture teaching from? Oh, man, there's just so many different angles. Um, some people... Some people use the rapture as like, my life is hard. This would be a great way to leave, right? Yeah. Um, I never thought of the rapture that way until about 2020 when things started to get really hard. And I'm like, wow, this is like, this This could potentially suck before we leave. That's right, <laughs> yeah. When I read, um, when I was incarcerated and I read the great, uh, the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, that was the book that did it. And then, yeah. of course, I would get the Bree and Call by Dave Hunt every month and read his articles about the rapture. And what he really described it was, was our blessed hope. So the angle yeah. I take is it's our blessed hope. It, it's part of the gospel because if we have this blessed hope, it spurs us on to love and good deeds. It motivates yeah. us to evangelism. It doesn't, it doesn't motivate us to go sit on the couch or, you know, start a cult and wait on a mountain for the Lord. It, it tells us that, hey, we have to get busy now because the time is short. Ephesians says, uh, redeem the time because the days are evil. And that's why I call my channel Busy for the Lord, because I realize, well, I got to get busy because we don't have much time left. That's right. And it's always had a purifying effect on the church. First John 3 says it has a purifying effect. So, when you talk to the naysayers, you talk to the mockers of the rapture, oh, you guys just want to escape everything. You don't care. Well, that's not true. Uh, biblically, it, it helps us to care, if that if that makes sense. 
You know, absolutely. I find that the re- rapture is oftentimes reproached as an escapist. I, you guys just, you don't really want to get uh, weighed out in the world and get involved with the world. You just want to get out of the world and escape from the world. It's tragic that people would throw reproaches like that at at those that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, you're probably going to find a stray soul here and there that's in that kind of a fortress mentality. But the fact of the matter is, people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture are right at the cutting edge of evangelism in America. They have been at the cutting edge of evangelism and mission work since the mid-1800s. So this reproach is really empty. And it's just tragic that people are willing to throw around a bogus reproach like that. Um, But, you know, what's interesting about it is I've discovered that false doctrine, their their primary weapon is not their theological arguments they make from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. They'll use the proof text, but their primary weapon is to bludgeon people with accusations and, and try and shame them into surrendering to the error, yeah. try and bring them through fear into the error. Yeah. And, but the truth is, is not fear-based. Uh, truth is truth-based. And even if yeah. someone starts out on the fear path for getting saved, they're afraid of going to hell. It doesn't take long in the scriptures where that fear gets completely unwound and they get wrapped up in the love of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because, uh, you know, the theme tonight is is the the word is a lamp unto our feet in a dark world. Well, well, here's when we talk about this world being dark, what are we talking about? Yeah, you know, there's, there's different aspects of that darkness. What I see is um, a spiritual darkness, right? We know that, that, that we live in a fallen world and that apart from Christ, we are dead in our sins and trespasses and, and we are spiritually blind. I know what it's like to be spiritually blind. I was spiritually blind for 19 years. I thought I was a believer. I thought I was going to heaven, but I was in spiritual darkness. But by the grace of God, I was transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. So the darkness that we are experiencing right now is a spiritual darkness. All the problems can be stemmed back to our sin nature, right? Or some other, um, or the spiritual war that's going on in heaven uh, with with, uh, principalities and powers Ephesians talks about. You know, you look at the the decisions that are made in the world. A lot of it's demonic influence. Um, A lot of it's due to our sin and pride and all of that. So, I think the darkness that we are experiencing right now is a spiritual darkness, and it is getting darker and darker, as the Bible said it would. One thing I think of, too, when I think of darkness, um, is ideas, false ideas, false teaching, false philosophies, false ideologies, false rationale. It's these false ideas that get out here in the world, and those false ideas try and make righteousness look like unrighteousness, try and make right look wrong, try and make wrong look right, try and justify living for the pleasures of sin for a season. Somehow, by the grace of God, we need to get free from all those lies and all that deceit. Absolutely. And a lot of what the Lord taught me early on in my, in, 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 after I got saved was false teaching and I don't and I didn't know why I was having to learn all this so fast but now I understand that there's such an assault um upon the church with false teaching there's so much confusion I feel like you spend more less time evangelizing and more time trying to clear up so much error within the church you know whether it be the basics of the gospel or prophecy um, keeping the keeping the word of God in context and explaining to people how important proper hermeneutics is in yep. study to show thyself approved. And he talked about um, ideas. Um, I have a list of things that are affecting the church. I've that I just think um, are polluting the church, and they're polluting. They're, they're blurring the lines between the world and the church, and just 
see Satan works under deception, right? He right. he uses the truth and he mixes error so that people are just completely bamboozled. So like they're drawn in because it because there's some truth to it, but at the end of the day, it's it's got this element of lies mixed in. So you're kind of like, is that that something doesn't sound right? And a lot of people they just don't want to do the extra work and figure out well, what does that mean? They're just like, okay, that sounds good, so I'm just gonna accept it. That's why more now than ever, we have to be so sharp and sharpen our discernment, especially with the plat the social media platforms that are out there now. They're all posing to have the truth and represent the Lord, but a lot of them are dishonoring the Lord because they're mishandling the scriptures. Yep. And to me, I often think of the fact that we are all going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and give account for everything that we did in the body, good or bad. Now, there's no negative repercussions at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, any bad doctrine, any bad lifestyle, it's going to burn up. And that's the end of it. The penalty for that's already been paid. The only thing that's being dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ is just getting us to see honestly uh, who we really were and where our weaknesses were. That's going to get dealt with. They get burned up. And then what's left is going to get rewarded with the same magnanimous grace that the Lord saved us with in the first place. But I think a lot of people don't really enter into the fact that they are going to give account for their doctrine. They tend to look to regard doctrine, matters of doctrine and discernment as secondary, you know, just get them saved, get them in the basic discipleship, don't worry about anything else. What would you say to somebody that goes down that path? We don't need to worry about doctrine. Well, I'll tell you how important doctrine is. Let me just, you know, let me just share you one example as a former Catholic, okay? So I have people within, I've heard people within Protestant churches that are a part, that I was a part of say, well, uh, I would bring up the fact that I'm a former Catholic and how I I want to reach my family members who are majority are still Catholic. And they say, well, I, I, I know someone who's a Christian that's a Catholic. And so what they're doing is they're saying it's OK to remain Catholic after you become born again. Yeah. And I always tell them, OK, and this is why doctrine matters, Lee, because you can have you can have uh a false gospel and and people are not even aware that they're pushing a false gospel because what they're doing is endorsing them staying in the church like if for instance a lot of people don't know about catholicism they don't know that it's a workspace salvation yep. so they're like oh there's you know my my friend that's a christian he's also a catholic well do you know that the catholic church preaches a false doc a false gospel what do you mean well they also they also preach a false jesus well, what do you mean well that's where you get into the doctrine the teaching doctrine is just another word for teaching. You have to help them to understand that um, if they want to represent the Lord, the best is to leave that church because you're never going to reform it. They tried that 1500 years ago. It didn't work out very well. Um, if you stay in that church, you're going to be involved in a lot of false doctrine. You know, the worship of Mary, the Eucharist, which is idolatrous. They're, 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 they're essentially worshiping the Eucharistic Christ. They're embracing a false gospel of works and sacraments. And so a true Christian would never stay in a system that's false. They would be a better light, a better witness to remove themselves from that false system. And so doctrine matters, okay? And, you, and, and we see this ecumenical movement right now where they're trying to, you know, form this one world religion and Roman Catholicism, the Pope is the number one person pushing this. You know, forget about doctrine, he says. Forget about being divisive. Let's all get together and make this thing work, right? And true doctrine is in the word of God, and the devil hates the word of God. So, of course, he's going to say doctrine doesn't matter. Let's just all get along and, you know, sing kumbaya. So I think it's interesting that basically if you boil what you just said down into a nutshell, you would be saying I don't believe in missionary church membership. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, what's, what's interesting about that, on that very principle, there's a related mistake that a lot of Christians make. And that's that they look at the church, the primary purpose of the church is simply to preach evangelism. And so every, every church meeting is an evangelistic meeting. 
I wouldn't say that's wrong, but that's really kind of short-sighted because mm-hmm. the primary purpose of the church meeting is not to see souls saved. The primary purpose of the church getting together is the edification of the believers that they can grow in the Word of God and in, 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 in discipleship. And if you want to have a meeting designated for outreach, that would be great. But most of our outreach is actually done or should be done outside the church, getting people saved outside the church and then bringing them into the church. Yeah. And I think going back to that um, spiritual war, uh, spiritual warfare and why the world is getting darker. Well, the church is called what? The light and salt, the salt and light of the earth. That's right. And how are we going to shine bright if we're not sharp, right? Most of the people within the churches, the so-called churches, are biblically illiterate. They don't know their Bibles. And then they have pastors that are too afraid of offending people, and they're creating this cozy environment in order to try to get people in the pews or in the seats, but they're not equipping their flock like a true shepherd should. So they're not getting sound teaching. They're not getting sound doctrine or verse-by-verse Bible teaching. And so they leave the church every Sunday with a lack of understanding of the scriptures because honestly, a lot of the people that go to the churches, and I found this out moving to the South because I'm from Wisconsin, I thought coming to the Bible Belt, people would be more on fire and have a better understanding of the scriptures. Not so. They Most people have gotten very complacent because they just hear the same old surface level teachings. They never go deeper. And so how are they equipped to go out into the world Mm. and evangelize if they don't even have that fire to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So um, getting back to the spiritual darkness, it's just I feel like the the influence of the church um, could be so much more, but it's not because of all the false doctrine and all the tares among the wheat. I believe there's a lot of false converts within the the, the church. I, the church, I mean, the you know, the church is the brick and mortar churches that I'm talking about, not yep. the true church that's born again. Well, that's an interesting concept, and I was gonna wanted to get into that um, further down the road, but since it's here for a subject, you, you're talking about true converts and false converts. This is a an issue that frustrates a lot of people today. Um, I have been in controversy off and on for the last year or so with folks involved in YouTube ministry who who they always talk about free grace. And it's, it's not that grace isn't free. I mean, that's that's just an elementary question. But it just seems like when this subject comes up and people want to start throwing that term around, it's it's almost like they're putting the blinders on and they just seem to not understand that when the gospel of grace comes out, some people are truly born again by that gospel, Mm -hmm. and some people will um, receive it for a season but not really enter into it. They're not born again. Uh, The cares of the world come in, choke them out, or, or the seed falls on stony ground and it doesn't really bring forth eternal life in the heart. So we see false converts, and it's just, it's really a frustrating issue to me that we have gone from an evangelical church that by and large was relatively uh, balanced on this issue and until the last few decades, you're just seeing this gospel where everybody that said a prayer 10 or 20 years ago, they're, they're saved. It doesn't matter how they live. And there's no relationship between being born again and how you live. Yeah. And I mean, I bet any one of us, people in the chat room, people that are going to be watching this video, uh, this live stream, we all know somebody that claims to be a Christian. They'll say, I'm a Christian, I accepted the Lord. But their life, their mouth, everything about their life screams that maybe maybe they're not. You know, and it's like, I know a lot of people get upset because they're like, well, we're, you're a fruit inspector. You can't judge someone else's salvation. But at the same time, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul was pretty clear about this. And I always take people to this verse. Let me just quick turn there, Lee. Um, this is actually a topic I'm very passionate about. It's not our job to assure them of their salvation, but it is our job to challenge and um, 
get them to get, give them an understanding of what it means to be born again. Because I, can, I guess I could consider myself to be a false convert for 19 years as a former Roman Catholic. I literally thought I was a good person. I was baptized as an infant. I was an altar boy. I stayed in line with the church. I went to mass every Sunday and I thought I was on my way to heaven. And if I would have died in that state, I would have ended up in hell. And I would have been one of those saying, Lord, Lord, I did this, that, and the other. And he said, he would have, he would have said to me, Dustin, I never knew you. And, right. I, and I would have been like, wow. So this, this idea of false conversion is a real thing. And there's lots of false converts within the church. And I think that's why the church lacks power because we're filling these churches full of people that are unconverted. Um, but second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five, Paul says, he even says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Question mark. Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that you are not disqualified. So again, it's not our job to say you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, but it is our job to lovingly speak the truth of love and say, hey, I mean, what did, what did that look like when you said a prayer at five years old? I mean, look at your life. He who is in Christ is a new creation, right? You don't get hit by a train and not remain unchanged. You don't get hit by the living God and remain unchanged. There's going to be change in your life. And so it's our job to lovingly guide these people. And that's part of discipleship too. It's Amen. hard to do. People are going to get offended. But at the end of the day, it's better to for them to know they know the Lord than to them to be like, maybe I know the Lord, you know? Yep. One thing I often think about is a believer can slow the process of progressive sanctification down, but they cannot stop that process. If they persist in a path trying to stop or derail that process, and they're born again, the Lord will discipline them. Yes. If that doesn't work, he will discipline them harshly. And if that doesn't work, he will take them home. Um, this, this is the clear teaching of Scripture. And what's interesting to me is how people can get so worked up over justification and not get worked up over regeneration. Mm -hmm. You can't. You, we can distinguish these two things, but you can't divide them. G Jesus isn't a cafeteria lunch. You don't get to go through the lunch line and say, okay, I'll say yes to justification, get my sins forgiven. That's really cool. But I'm going to say no to sanctification because I really want to indulge my fornication and my drugs or whatever it is. Um, and, and I'll just worry about getting cleaned up, you know, later on. Absolutely. We don't get that choice. Um, so a scripture that just popped in my mind when you said that, um, when Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 20, Paul says, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body, in your, in your spirit, which are yours? No, which are God's. If believers understand that when they accept the Lord into their life, that they are now the Lord's, right? Yep. And the sanctification process is us becoming set apart to be more Christ-like and holy and in that our life is not our own. We were crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in with, within me. And when you have that mindset, man, you are just so much more effective for the Lord. You are just so much more powerful because you get out of the way and his spirit starts flowing through you. And it's amazing. So I think when people have understand that doctrine, right? Such a horrible word, doctrine. It just, it's life transforming. Yeah. Well, to me, it's also interesting to see that people don't really understand grace. One of my favorite passages is in Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present evil age. When, when grace comes, if you say, well, I do, I would like to have my sins forgiven. That sounds pretty cool but I got no interest in forsaking my sins. Guess what? You have resisted the Holy Spirit. How can you resist the Holy Spirit and be saved? You have resisted grace. How can you resist grace and be saved? You snubbed your nose at grace. So when, when the Lord brings the message of grace, repentance is part of the message of grace. You cannot repent on the basis of law. 
Anyone that tries to repent on the basis of law is not going to get very far, very fast at all. The law is unable to clean a man up. The law is unable to bring a man into a good conscience. It's unable to bring a man to repentance. The Bible plainly states it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. It's the grace of God that leads men to repentance. And if Christians could enter into this, I think it would clear things up for them a lot when they're wrestling with the issue of grace. Amen. Amen. Spot on. Spot on. So now, uh, here's one more thing I wanted to ask you, and that is, we've been quoting a lot of scripture here. We've we've quoted scripture on grace. We've quoted scripture on the gospel. We've quoted some scripture on repentance and on sanctification. But this implies the whole question of why do we need to cling to Scripture? Why is the Word of God so important to the believer? Yeah. Well, a couple of verses that come to my mind is um, many of this is one of the very first verses that I first verse that I memorized when I was a baby Christian in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to cling to the word because that's all we have. That's right. And it's all we need. Um, God has chosen to reveal himself through the scriptures. And... Whenever I have a question about something that's that I'm puzzled by, there's there's rarely an event where it cannot be answered by the word of God. And when it comes to your biblical, we talk about a biblical worldview, right? That we view the our world through the lens of scripture. It clears everything up. Why did bad things happen in the world? Scripture has an answer. Where are we going after we die? Scripture has an answer. Uh, what about certain moral issues that are going on in society right now? Scripture has an answer. What about the hope that what kind of hope can we give people in this world today? Scripture has the answer. What about history and geology and and how the earth was formed? Uh, Scripture has the answer. How about archaeology? Scripture has the answer. I mean, there's nothing that Scripture, I mean, there's obviously some things that Scripture doesn't talk about, but it's enough, like 2 Timothy 3.16 says. I want to share this real quick, and I and I knew I when as soon as my wife shared this with me, she said, I got she said, last night I was reading Psalm 12. She's like, have you ever read Psalm 12? And I'm like, probably at some point. But then when I read it, I just knew that I had to read it for tonight's live stream. So I just want to quick read Psalm 12. It says, help, Lord, for the godly man seizes, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all the flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Mm. You who have said with our tongue, we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. And I love this verse, verse six. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. So God's word is that that anchor that we can hold on to. The only thing that is pure in this world amongst all of this ungodliness that we are surrounded by. Amen. We absolutely need the Word of God. It, I've often thought that when God arranged the Bible for us, he looked down through the portals of time, and he could see, he foresaw every false doctrine, every false way, every false theology, every temptation. He saw every major issue that we were going to face as human beings trying to follow uh, the Lord in a in a God-hating world, and he answered them 
beforehand in the scriptures. And the better we know the Bible, the more we're going to be prepared for all of these problems. It struck me as a young believer that when the Lord Jesus was tempted by the devil, the devil came to him quoting scripture. Mm-hmm. And the the people quote scripture all the time. Every false doctrine that's taught in the church is taught with scripture. Mm-hmm. Well, what's the answer? Ah, it is written again. We need to have a, our, our doctrinal understanding based on the plain statements of Scripture interpreted by the plain statements of Scripture. If you don't have Scripture interpreted by Scripture, you're going to have Scripture interpreted by theology, and then you are going to be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And when you, when you have so many of these false teachings within the church, the only way— the only authority that we have as believers is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God rightly interpreted within its context. You know, a lot of cults have gotten started. A lot of false teaching has gotten started by taking one scripture verse, taking it out of its context and then expounding on it. I mean, we see all these teachings on YouTube and social media. They're trying to prove their point, but they're taking the scriptures out of context to prove their point. And people are like, what's wrong with that? Well, first of all, God is inseparable from his word, right? His word and him are joined together like this. So when you begin to misrepresent God's word in order to prove a point, then you are misrepresenting God. And then I have to ask, you have to ask yourself, do I have reverence and fear for the Lord? Do I love the Lord? Um, If I really love the Lord, I want to represent the Lord. And in order to do that, we have to rightly divide the word of God and, and present it within context. You can't, it's, you can't take someone's story and twist it for your own means, right? That's right. And that's why I like to encourage people, we really have to um, follow the historical grammatical hermeneutic. There's not going to be any truth taught in the Bible that's going to go against Greek grammar or Hebrew grammar. It's just not going to happen. God didn't arrange things that way. There's not going to be anything taught in the Bible that actually goes against the real facts of archaeology or the real facts of geology or the real facts of history. The same God that wrote the books of science is the God that wrote the book of the Bible. And there's nothing in the Bible that's to be that can be understood in a way that contradicts other passages of Scripture. Mm-hmm. And once we understand this, that there's no contradictions in God and the truth isn't contradictory to the truth, boy, it really clears things up. Absolutely. Before we get rolling on, I did want to give a shout out to my buddy Pete Garcia because I noticed that Rev 310 is in the room. So, hey, Pete's nice to have you on board. All right. And I do, before I, unless I forget too, I want to give a shout out to Aldo and to Hannah Lore and to my any other moderators that happen to be in the room tonight. I did notice those two. I, I really thank my moderators for the work that they do. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Uh, no YouTube channel is going to thrive the way it ought to thrive without uh, mm-hmm. moderators that are wise and discerning uh, and love the Lord, and they're on top of their game. They're a very vital part of any YouTube ministry. Amen. Well, let's talk about some practical issues. We've touched on a few already, but practical issues where people wrongly handle the Word of God. And we we talked in principle about the necessity of following context. Off the top of your head, what are what's an issue or two where you see people taking a verse and they really hammer it home, but if you would step back and look at the context, they are really out of place? Oh, man. Like, where do you begin? Um, I've done numerous videos on my channels uh on my channel yeah i do have channels but my channel discussing this the first one that pops into my head uh, is is the one in matthew 25 i believe let me go to matthew 25 now i had to come to understand this verse within its context because it was constantly being quoted over and over and over by people that promote the social gospel Uh, a lot of roman a lot of roman catholics will promote this gospel in fact, a lot of people, if they watch the Super Bowl, they have the, uh, it's not the Me Too movement, but it's the, uh, yeah, it's the Me Too movement uh, where they, 
they showed all these people washing feet representing Jesus, which they completely twisted the meaning of that yep. to make it more diversified and unified. But that's part of the social gospel I'm talking about. But um, the, the verse I have in my mind that's often taken out of context to promote a social gospel um, and good works is Matthew 25. And we'll start at verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, the reason I bring that verse up is when I first got saved, I wanted to reach uh, my aunt, who has been a nun and still is a Catholic nun for over 50 years. I wrote her a letter when I was incarcerated and I said to her, how do you hope to get to heaven? I wanted to see where she was at. There was nothing about the gospel, nothing about Jesus. She quoted that verse. And what that told me is that she was depending upon her own good works in a social gospel, a gospel of works to get her to heaven. And now we see this, this humanitarian uh, social gospel, give a cup of cold water without giving the gospel idea. It's so prevalent now, right? We see it in the in the replacement theology camps where they're they're promoting the kingdom now theology, which is like build the kingdom of God here, right? We need to uh, all get together and get along. The Rick Warren approach, the purpose driven approach. That's a verse that's taken out of context. That's not talking about a workspace salvation. That's not talking about a social gospel. That is talking about the judgment of the Gentiles at the end of the tribulation period, where Jesus is telling them, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world as he's, he's about ready to set up a millennial kingdom. But if you don't understand prophecy, if you don't understand dispensationalism or anything like that, you're not going to understand what these verses mean. So you need good Bible teaching within context to understand what this means. Now, we can obviously use the principles from these verses to do good works, but that's not what these verses are talking about. That's right. I've often told people the primary focus of that passage is the Jews in the tribulation. Secondary application is the Gentiles in the tribulation. The third application is any believers in this age. This is addressing believers. Mm -hmm. And it goes, uh, a, a similar one is to, to anyone that's given a cup of cold water in the name of a prophet even is not going to lose a reward. This isn't pushing uh, salvation on the basis of good works to believers, folks. This is pushing that the, I, the idea that real believers are going to respond like real believers. Mm -hmm. But I, I can remember way back in the 80s having a friend who was involved in a large Christian ministry. And this ministry was starting to go down the path of using Matthew 25 in a social gospel way. They were still preaching the gospel, but they were confused. They'd go in and, in villages and in different settings and really were, were the vanguard of the whole work was the social gospel aspect. And then they'd pass out gospel literature too, and people were saved. But I tried to point out to him that is abusing this passage, and he could not see it. I, I, I would get, wager that your average evangelical today misunderstands that passage. Yeah. You know, when, when I, when I first um, got out of prison in 2008, I joined, I joined a mega church, right? Because I liked the idea that they had a large youth ministry and I wanted to be a youth pastor. And one of the things we did was we got together with Habitat for Humanity and we built these walls for these, the, the homes for Habitat for Humanity it was called it was called Love Madison, Madison, Wisconsin, yep. and this whole campaign to love Madison. And I remember we were all getting together in this parking lot, tons of people building these walls, and it felt great. We were all like, "This is great." And at the end of it, I thought, "Well, how are we sharing the gospel with these people? We're just building wall. Anybody, unbelievers, can build and frame walls and like give them to Habitat for Humanity. How are we bridging that gap?" And sharing the gospel with the lost, right? And what I come to understand was is it's really part of the social gospel. 
Um, and so, you know, you have to kind of go through, I always felt like the Lord would take me through seasons where he would immerse me in certain things and then he would pull me out of them and say, see, no, that's what's wrong with it. That's, yeah. that's where most people get lost in it and then kind of show me the true colors of it. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, it does. Every one of us that's actually going forwards with the, with the Lord is going to find ourselves moving through eras of our life where we're involved in a situation that we don't see clearly is, is got problems. And then the lights come on as we grow in the word and we move on. And our pilgrimage might take us through one, two, three, four, even five or six different situations before we really come into our own. We really have grown in our discernment and we can look around and we really have a good idea. We, we know what needs to be done. We know how it needs to be done, and we go forth in the biblical way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, one of the things I think about is in Matthew 7, you know, verses 1 through 6, which is the classic judge not that you be not judge passage. And, oh, my goodness, over and over again in my Christian walk, I have people hammer with that. You're judging, brother. Yeah, I I am judging. The Bible Mm -hmm. commands me to judge righteous judgment, to make righteous discernment. Um, And if you'll notice in this passage, it doesn't ban judging. It bans hypocritical judging. It doesn't say don't ever judge. It says first take the log out of your eye, and then you can see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have an obligation to help our brethren walk in a more biblical manner, whether it's in their lifestyle, whether it's in what they believe, whether it's in how they present Uh, their worship of the Lord to the Lord. They have an obligation to do the same thing for us. This is iron sharpening iron. Yeah. And and we have an obligation to engage in this. Now notice later on this very same passage, it tells you not to um, cast your pearls before the swine and don't give holy things to the dogs. Now, how in the world can you identify hogs and dogs without judging? Right. It's absolutely impossible. And if you refuse to judge hogs and dogs, you are basically trampling on this passage of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to go down the absolutely no judging path, you are taking God's Word and you are twisting it to fit your theology. You are getting your Bible from your theology that's exactly backwards from getting your theology from the Bible. And, and we are living in an era where many people that profess to be born-again Christians, they profess to be evangelicals, they are actually writing their own Bibles. Mm. This is a dangerous precedent. Now, they're not actually sitting down with notebook paper or a typewriter or a computer and writing their own Bible. But they are engaging their mind with with the little rubber stamped interpretations of all these passages. They get the official interpretation and they live by 50 or 100 passages that they wrongly understand, and they don't spend time in the Bible. They don't let the Bible interpret the Bible. Mm-hmm. They are writing their own Bible. Yep. And I, to be honest, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, brother, but when I think about the rapture, I am not one of those that believe that the majority of people that are professed to be Christians are going up. When mm-hmm. I stop, I... I don't believe that there's going to be a high percentage at all in the Catholic Church. There'll be a small amount going up in the Catholic Church. There'll be a larger amount going up in Protestant churches. But I'm going to be surprised, brother, if 50% of the evangelicals go up. And in some evangelical circles, like some of the charismatic circles, especially going down the NER direction, it won't be 50%. It won't be 25%. It's going to be pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I agree 100%. And and you'll find this out, too, just doing a survey of local churches. I mean, I bet everybody in the chat room and everybody watching this can can share a story of how hard it is to find a good Bible-based local church. And the reason that is, is because you go from one church to the next, and it's hard enough to find a pastor that preaches the word, but then to find other like-minded believers that share their love for truth, okay? 
it's just like you want to go deeper. You get a part of these small groups. You get a part of these Bible studies. And it's like you, you, you just kind of get sick of the surface level stuff. And you just want to go deeper. You want to yeah. do more for the Lord. You want to increase your love for the Lord. You want to you want other men and women to sharpen you. But a lot of times you're finding yourself very disappointed. You, you find I know in past churches when I've taught a Bible study, there's been very few men that would come up to me and say, hey, let's discuss that more. Let's expound that more. Um, right away, they want to talk about the worldly things. And so that's a red flag to me. Like every church I've been in, every conversation always has to be something worldly. Now, I understand that there's you have to find common ground and we're there to support one another. And it doesn't always have to be a theological debate, but it always seems surface level. Why is it that I can't we can't find churches that things can be a little deeper? And my my conclusion is that maybe there's just not that many Christians, maybe that everybody that claims the name of Christ really aren't Christians. I know moving down here to the Bible Belt, everybody would say they're a Christian. But why? Because of the church they go to, the denomination they affiliate with, they were baptized as a child. I think there's, just like the Bible says, there are few. Uh, narrow is the gate. Wide is the gate that, that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Right? Yeah. Um, that's just the truth. It's, it's sad. Um, but that's just the truth of the matter. I remember years ago when I was a young man. Early in our marriage, I was had left a church we were at for different issues, trying to find a church I that would I would be interested in bringing my family to. And one of the uh, churches I I had to drive a couple hours away from Rhinelander to visit it, and I I looked at their their local church website and it looked pretty decent. Um, it was a New Testament Baptist church, and I. I looked at the the National New Testament Baptist Church website and and got an idea of their doctrinal statement and on paper it looked pretty decent. So I drove to this meeting and the the first hour was a Sunday school meeting and the man droned on and on about being filled with the Holy Spirit and I it there, it was a dry, one of the driest sermons I've ever heard and it was really kind of awkward to to see such a dry dry, dead message on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It made no sense to me. And then the second meeting where they had the guest speaker come in, who was like a national representative for the New Testament Baptists, and this was probably, I'm going to guess, 25 years ago, but um, it was also sad. The guy got up, and I don't even remember what he used for a proof text, but we didn't really get a sermon. It was just story after story. And he talked mostly about football and about games he'd watched recently and his favorite football teams. And I was just, I just, something's really, really off here. This is really weird. And so then afterwards, they had a pot, like a potluck meal. And I um, walked from the first building to the second building. And this guest teacher and the pastor were walking together. And I don't remember which one said that. But I'm carrying my Bible. I, I carry my Bible with me everywhere I go. Now, I've graduated to carrying a smartphone so that I can have my Greek and my Hebrew and about a half a dozen English translations and a bunch of other translations handy. So I, I, I'm still carrying my Bible with me everywhere I go. But I'm carrying at this time my leather-bound King James Bible. And one of these guys said to me, oh, you won't need that. Go put that in your car. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> We're not going to fellowship. It, it, I mean, to me, just yakking about football or hunting or fishing, a little bit of that might be involved in fellowship, but we're fellowshipping in the things of the Lord. Yeah. So I put yeah. my Bible in the car and we sat down, we potlucked and we hunted and we fished and we footballed and we baseballed and we basketballed. And after about an hour, I hightailed it. I never, ever since then have ever even given a glance to a New Testament Baptist church. Yeah. Now that you know, it's it's probably sad because I'm sure there are New Testament Baptist churches out there that are really some solid churches. But wow, did that experience sour me? Um, and and I've but you know I've had similar experiences. I've I've been in 
Pentecostal churches and Bible churches and Baptist churches uh, where it seems like it's almost impossible to get somebody to have a spiritual conversation about yes. the things of the Lord. Yes. If someone starts talking about their four-barrel carburetors, man, the guys gather around like flies in a barn. And yeah. if you start talking about fishing or hunting, people gather. You start talking about uh, the Game of Thrones or your favorite TV shows, and people are just really there and all excited. But you yeah. start talking about prophecy or the signs of the times or mm -hmm. about your latest soul-winning endeavors, and people just seem uninterested. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that. You know, um, anytime I try to bring up the rapture, it just they they give you that look, and you know that look, like, like, dude, you're re you're wrecking my life. Like, I have I have dreams and hopes. I have a lot of unaccomplished goals that I have. I'm about to retire. Um, I got grandkids. Like, what are you talking about the rapture for? Like, oh. We don't know that, you know, we don't, we don't really know when Jesus is coming back. So why waste your time on it? You know, and I just kept telling them, well, you know, in Revelation, there's a special reward for those who seek to understand these things, you know, like Jesus wants it. There's a whole book called the Revelation. Like, why wouldn't you want to know? That's too hard to understand. No, it's not. It's really easy to understand. And so just like you said, it's, it's, it's like, it's kind of, you kind of narrow yourself down. So you have the large church where you just talk about Bible and then you want to go a little deeper about theology, and then you go smaller down to prophecy, then the rapture, and then you're just like left with a few people that you, you know, huddle around, and then the rest of you people look like, oh, you're just extreme, and like, you know, we'd rather not talk to you because we, we know if we start talking to you, you're going to talk about Jesus, and that makes us real, really uncomfortable, and you're like, I'm in church, I'm talking about Jesus, and this makes you uncomfortable? Oh, we have to be in the end times. That's you know right. I mean? That's right. I think there's going to be a lot of shock when the rapture trumpet sounds. And there are going to be evangelical churches across the land that are going to have people left behind. Maybe some will only be 5 or 10%, but some are going to be 20, 30%. Some are going to be 40 and 50%. Some are going to be 70 and 80%. There yep. are going to be a lot of people left behind. That yeah. is going to be the greatest wake-up call in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think that's why we see in Revelation 7, all of those people, you know, wearing those white robes, some of these people will get a second chance. You know, a lot of people ask me all the time, is there going to be a second chance after the rapture? Well, maybe, because the rapture itself will probably cause a lot of people to die based on who knows what, if you're driving a bus, you're on the highway, or in, you know, in an airplane. And, um, but you, that's why you don't wait. You don't wait until the tribulation to get saved. That's what we're, that's what we're busy about. Get right with the Lord today. If you don't know the Lord. Um, but we see that great, um, harvest of souls from the 144,000 and the two witnesses. I mean, God's going to do everything possible to get the world's attention. And then that's going to be it. So, that's I would right. rather I would rather be a part of the church age. I mean, we are so blessed to be a part of the church age and seeing all this and, and just to squander your life for what? You know, just to wait till the end that you might hope to make it. It's just ridiculous. Yep. And what's to me what when I think of the tribulation, God is the God of second chances. He has always been the God of second chances. That's not going to change just because the rapture happened. Right. Now if you happen to die in the immediate aftermath of the rapture, of course, you've lost your opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have already committed the unpardonable sin in your heart, you've gone down the path of the Pharisees and you have resisted the Holy Spirit uh, until the point of a seared conscience, of course, then you're not going to get a second chance. And it won't be because God's not a God who gives second chances. It's, it's that God could give you a hundred second chances and your wicked heart is already committed to the wrong way. Yep. But as a general rule, God is giving the entire world uh, a second chance. And the rapture is a big slap upside the head. It's time to wake up and get right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why Satan is working so hard through society to try to cover up 
the rapture, right? Absolutely. You have the new age movement. They have their version of a rapture. You have the Hollywood version of the rapture, which is alien abduction. You see, you know, uh, Las Vegas and that just watching the Super Bowl. I just noticed some of the commercials that were trying to um, get people to warm up to the idea of alien abduction. I mean, we've seen it for years, but it's really ramping up now. And again, you could use that as an apologetic that there is a rapture. Oh, absolutely. Of all the, the counterfeit raptures. It's yeah. just amazing to see. Well, and to me, that that, that we see so much pop culture references to the rapture now and so much Hollywood reference to the to the rapture from the alien abduction perspective and from some other vanishing perspectives that appeared in uh in the uh, science fiction movies to me the fact that this is just picking up in an incredible acceleration here that is a sign of the end times it's mm -hmm. a sign the rapture's close yeah amen amen brother well do you have any closing thoughts or encouragements you would like to leave the the, the saints with um to wrap the program proper up and then we'll go into a time of q a okay well, to kind of wrap up the theme, and I, and I just think that's awesome because when we were kind of talking back and forth about uh, where, where we wanted the Lord to lead this live stream, the topic and all that, I just thought it was so perfect that you talked about the word being a light um, to our path. Um, at the end of the day, we just need to get into our Bibles more. I mean, I can't get in my Bible enough. Amen. So my encouragement to the saints out there is don't. Don't listen to someone because they're popular. Don't follow blindly. Test all things. The Bible says test all things. The Bible says be a Berean. Search all those Amen. things, whether they are so. The Bible says rightly divide the word of God. Be a workman that's approved. The Bible says in order to have wisdom, we need to have the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord comes with um, having a holy reverence for God, understanding that he's God, we are not. He's God, we are not. He's infinite, we are finite, That's which right. means that he has the full revelation, we don't. So when we hear people on YouTube saying, I know this, or God told me this, we should always question it with the word of God. Or if they take a Bible verse and they do a whole sensational prophecy teaching off of one Bible verse, test it with the word of God. Amen. So that's my that's my conclusion there. Amen. That's a good way to wrap this program up, is to use the Word of God to test and prove interpretations of the Word of God. The Amen. Bible is its own best interpreter. The Bible is its own, um, well, it comes with its own internal testing unit, is, is really a good way to put it. Amen. Test the circuits. Here's the first question. How can some tribulation saints survive when they're not able to buy and sell all the way through the 70th week, how are they going to survive? Mm. That's a great question. I've often thought about that. Now, I don't always like to reference movies, but this particular movie that I watched kind of helped me understand how God uh, works supernaturally to sustain his people. Now, we know that there's going to be millions and millions of people martyred. They're yep. going to they're going to choose to be outside of the beast system. Um, so they're going to have to survive. And what's interesting to me is that before the rapture, we are seeing a, 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 a rise, a rise in people having homesteads, yep. learning how to grow their own food, survival uh, kits. A lot of us who are part of the church, maybe some of us have an emergency food, freeze dried food for whatever power outage. Yep. Who, who knows who may come across that, some of the left behind. So God is able, just like he did with Israel, to sustain his chosen people, his elect. That's right. Whether they be Gentiles or Israel. We know that God is going to have to uh, reserve a third of the Jews. Uh, Zechariah 13 talks about a third of the Jews will be saved. Two thirds will be cut off and die. And he, and he sends them into the wilderness and sustains them supernaturally. Uh, for three and a half years. So the same with the Gentiles. We see God preparing, setting the stage for Gentiles to survive outside the beast system. So um, that movie I watched, by the way, was called The Moment After. And it talked and it showed one of the 144,000 
the guy was a Jew and he was, he got saved and, and how he was like, they're all taking care of each other, just like they did in the New Testament church in the book of Acts. And I kind of envision that happening um, in the tribulation too. Yeah, there's various other ways too that people are going to survive. One of the ones is that those that obey the command to flee Jerusalem in the middle of the 70th week and flee to the wilderness, they are going to be preserved by God. It doesn't really tell us the manner by which they preserve, but this is the same God that could bring in a flock of quail or provide manna every day. He will provide for his own. Uh, we also have a promise in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 20. I believe it's in 24. But anyway, watch and pray that you may be counted worthy. So there's an element here that that there is a promise for at least some of the Jewish and Gentile believers in the tribulation, if they're watching and praying in the right manner, that that's going to lead to their preservation. doesn't tell us exactly how. But I've counted about a half a dozen different ways in the Scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, where men are preserved in the tribulation. Um, I think probably the bulk of the people, uh, especially of the Gentiles, are going to suffer as martyrs. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be a great multitude saved that no man can number. Amen. It is appointed for every man to die and then judgment. Who does this apply to? Well, when I think about that verse, um, well, what I think about is some of the hard things in Scripture that you have to answer. So Enoch. He never died. Uh, Elijah was taken up. What do you do with those instances in the Bible? Because, I mean, this 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 verse in Hebrews is obviously a general rule. Is it a point? It's appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. Um, we 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 see so many books within the Christian bookstore. I died and I went to hell, or I died and I went to heaven. I question a lot of those books um, based on the fact that of this scripture and just that, the you know, some of their revelations that they apparently see, they contradict scripture, contradict a lot of scripture. Um, now, what was the what was the question, though, Lee? Like, well, I think they're wondering how, how, if this is true, then yeah. how does it fit together with the rapture? Because obviously the rapture, people are not going to die. Right, right. I'm going to leave that to you, Brother Lee. Yeah, well, I like to tell people the angle to understand this verse is not that it's required for every man to die, because that's simply not the case. It's But what is required is you only get one chance. If you die, it's over. You die yep. saved, you're saved. You die lost, you're lost. There's no second chances to lose your salvation there's no second chances to gain your salvation. When, when you die, it's over. Now, right. the fact of the matter is, we know that there are some men in history who have not died. We know at the rapture, they are not going to die. They're going to be changed without ever dying. We also know that the godly that enter into the kingdom, uh, the, the sheep at the sheep and goats judgment, they will never die. There is no death in the millennium except for the death penalty at 100 years of age. If you haven't received the Lord Jesus by the time you're 100, you will be executed by capital punishment according to Isaiah chapter 65. Mm -hmm. Now, also anyone that's born in the kingdom and born again, they will never die. Mm -hmm. So where we have to, to go back to this and we're saying, okay, this is only talking about the fact that you get one shot. That's all it's talking about. You know, because if you had to die, the rapture would be an ugly situation. If every man is required to die before the resurrection, then at the rapture, the Lord's going to take us up about a mile, take us over a great big airport runway, and let us drop, and we're all going to do a massive splat on the ground before we get resurrected. Mm. Well, folks, mm. that is not going to happen. So I think this is a, a good example of there's common interpretations of verses that are just not right. And we need to have a breadth and depth of our scriptural understanding on right. the subjects to relate to the verse, and then we can put the verse in context, yep. and that'll take us in the right direction. Yep. Well, here's one that you probably have some light on, brother. 
what is the best way to witness to a serious Catholic without offending them? Well, I could tell you the wrong way and the right way. The wrong way is what I did when I first got saved, which was to tell them everything that was wrong with the Catholic Church. That's never something you want to do. Uh, they usually close their ears and they get they have a hardened heart towards you. The best way to witness to a Catholic is, first of all, with your life. Um, you'll get an opportunity. I Trust me, the Lord has given me lots of op open opportunities, open doors to share the gospel with my family. When they see your changed life, you know, a lot of uh, my family were very skeptical. Oh, they, oh, he just got jailhouse Christianity. He just needs Jesus while he's in prison. He's going to get out and just be just like us. Then a couple of years pass and I marry a Christian woman and we have children and she starts homeschooling. Well, homeschool? What are you doing with that? You know, and just like our lives are radically changed. They begin to ask questions and they realize they are different. Yep. I mean, he doesn't drink. He doesn't attend parties. He's not drinking at the weddings like we are. So you witness to a Catholic by your life. And then when the Lord opens up that door, you share the gospel of grace apart from works because a typical Catholic is trusting in the fact that they're a good person and that they're, they're, they're working their way to heaven based on their own merit. And some Catholics even believe in purgatory, that there's going to be a second chance to be purified from their sins. Uh, so what you need to do is give them the gospel of grace. Just give them the word of God. I did that with my oldest sister, and uh, she came to the Lord. And uh, I didn't tell, I didn't, she didn't come to the Lord based on me arguing Catholic theology. She came to the Lord because she started reading the Bible. Yep. Because she saw me reading the Bible and she saw my changed life. So that's the best way to do it. Amen. Is baptism necessary <clears throat> to enter the kingdom? Well, that's an easy one. Um, if they're talking about water baptism, which everybody thinks, <clears throat> no, it's, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is very clear. For by grace we are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Where baptism comes in is, uh, I remember when I got saved in May of 2005, the next thing the Lord impressed me to do out of obedience was to be uh, baptized, water baptized as a public profession of an inward change. Yes. So salvation doesn't, bapt or baptism doesn't save you, but... It, it's out of obedience, you do this as a public uh, proclamation of your inward change, showing people that I've been saved, this is why I'm saved. Yep, and I like to remind people that according to Romans chapter 6, your baptism is a public funeral. It's your profession that you are now dead to the world, and you are going to rise in newness of life and live in newness of life in the world. And as Galatians says, crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. Here's an interesting question. Do you think that Eve was lying when she said to the serpent in Genesis 3.3, but God said, neither shall you even touch it lest you die? So was she lying, or was she just being extra cautious? Oh, my word. <laughs> to be a fly on the wall in the Garden of Eden. Uh yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting question. Is that reference to Genesis three? It'd be better if I could go to that exact verse. Yeah, that's Genesis. Yeah, the New three, King four. James says, verse three. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, "You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die." Hmm. So we know that Adam was instructed. Right. God gave Adam the command um, that he, you know, they would die if they touched. And so that's why Satan came in there and used deception to get basically Adam through Eve. So the question is, was Eve lying? I guess yeah. I'm not understanding the question very good. Yeah. Well, I think they're wondering, was she lying or was she just being extra cautious? Because, you know, the command was don't eat of it. Right. But just the way human beings work, God, let's just, for instance, God gives us a command, don't go near the cliff over there because, or maybe the civil government say the same thing, don't go near that cliff. 
Mm -hmm. because you can fall off that cliff and die in the rocks below. Don't play by it. Sometimes the edge collapses. So typically what's going to happen in something like that, whether we're dealing with the command of God or whether we're dealing with the command of man, we're going to build a fence 10 feet, 15 feet away from <laughs> right. that cliff. Right. And the, the fence is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yes. But it would be a bad thing if we somehow got confused and we started confusing God's command to don't go near the cliff with God's command. And we're so, well, God commanded us to put a fence 15 feet from the cliff. And then to go beyond and say, well, God commanded us not even to touch the fence. We got to stay 15 feet from the fence. Right. Well, we're now we're moving away from a reasonable, evangelical, personal guard to something that's just becoming empty religious formality. Yeah. Um, it, it can take on a life of its own, and it actually, what was intended to promote holiness will actually derail it. Absolutely. And I, I guess that's where she was probably going, just the kind of human thinking that we have where, um, you know, we want to put a guard on there. It's like, okay, God says I can't eat that tree. I know myself. So I'm just going to make sure I don't even get close enough to touch that tree. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Um, it'd be hard. We can see that clearly. Now, to start reading the motives behind that, whether she was uh, perfectly evangelical in that motive or whether she was not so evangelical in the motive. Right. Uh, we're going to probably find out in theology 102 i don't think we'll find out in theology 101 right right exactly our conversions are <laughs> salvations of young children authentic <clears throat> and valid i don't think so um my wife being one she my wife got saved when she was three years old her mom shared the gospel in the car with her and she remembers accepting the lord and she she remembers the change uh she remembers feeling very different her entire childhood she didn't know why she was so different um but she definitely was saved at an early age and i think it's different for every child right yep. we, i have three children um i explain things differently to each child i, I have to reach them in a different way so there are childhood conversion stories, no doubt. But it's important for us as adults to lead a child in the way they should go. We should help them to understand what they are doing. You know, we tend to believe the child right away, maybe because they're our own children and we just want them to be saved so bad that we just check our mind at the door and we don't go any further in detail on what they're getting into. You know, for instance, um, my oldest son, he, he got saved and people at church were getting baptized and I guess he didn't really know what that meant. And then all of a sudden, you know, we explained that to him. And then one time he just, they were having these baptisms. He's like, I want to be baptized. And we're like, do you understand what that means? He's like, yes. And so he got baptized that day. We did not know that he was going to do this. And so the Lord just works differently on different children at different points. Every child's different. So yep. I don't think we should discredit child of um, conversion by any means. No. I would just say go slow and cautious. Yeah. I I have met people that were saved when they were five years old. I've also met a lot of people that have a childhood profession, whether they were six or ten or twelve, and it went absolutely nowhere at mm. at a snail's pace. So yeah. it just it's just a matter of caution. There's no law against children being saved. There's no right. rule against it. Right. It's, it's just that most children haven't fully developed their moral faculties yet. and They don't really understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, here is an, we got an interesting question. Can one man judge another person to not be saved because that man doesn't display the works expressed in Scripture? Uh, That's a loaded question, isn't it? It's a loaded question, and I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to get the main point of that question. So what do you think they're saying here? Well, I think they're just asking if, in principle, it's it's legitimate to determine that this professing Christian is really not saved. 
Well, I, I will tell you that there's a certain individual in my life that has professed to be a Christian. At times, I thought this individual w- was a Christian because of the things that they said. And then there was times and seasons where I was feeling led by the Lord to say, no, you need to press this issue a little bit more and talk to this person a little bit more because I think they might be a false convert. At yep. the end of the day, the scripture says the Lord knows those who are his. So it's not our job, again, to give the person the assurance. That's the Holy Spirit's job. His spirit bears witness with their spirit that they are children of God and cry out, Abba, Father, Romans 8. Yep. But our job is if we're being led by God, that that this person might be or have an inkling that they might be a false convert based on some of the things we've seen, that it's our job to speak the truth and love to them. I don't think at the end of the day we can say, okay, now you're a Christian or now you're not a Christian. It's it's kind of like that fine line that you that you that you uh, walk on, if if that makes sense. Yep. I don't. Know. I like to point out too where you know the Lord knows them that are His, and it goes on to say, "Let everyone that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity." Now this wow, is the Lord yeah. saying this. This is not Lee saying this. This is not. Uh, any preacher saying this, this is the Lord saying this. This is important to him. Um, And so, in principle, part of just like a child desires his mother's milk and a child is desiring to learn to crawl and then to learn to walk and then to learn to run, you can't stop a child from going that way. Um, Same with a a, a child believer. There's going to be a hunger for the Word, there's going to be a hunger to learn to crawl, then to learn to walk, stand, then to learn to walk, then to learn to run. You're going to see this progress. And, and so as a general rule, I think, yes, we're, we're looking for a principle of departing from iniquity. Now, we need to have a little bit of caution here because, folks, we are looking for signs of life. We are not looking for signs of health. If you go around... Uh, checking for a pulse, and that's all you're checking for, the fact of a pulse, um, then you're probably not going to make a lot of mistakes. If you go around with an artificial test and say, if your pulse is under 45 beats a minute, I'm not going to believe you're a real Christian. Okay, you are going to make a bajillion mistakes, and you are going to damage and harm the work of God. Um, We are looking for signs of life, not signs of health. Signs of health is a completely different thing. That's a matter of discipleship, not salvation. Now, um, the other thing I want to point out is we have to be very careful that we don't judge a person by one snapshot in his life. You take a snapshot of Saul at the right part of his life, and he (laughs) looks like he's a godly man. You take a snapshot of David at the wrong part of his life, and he looks like he's a heathen. And if you take a snapshot of his life at another part, he looks like it's a crazy man that belongs in a lunatic asylum. Yeah. So you've got to be very careful with this. It's not that it's wrong to have discernment and to be trying to discern whether a person's a real believer or not. But this is a thing that needs time. It needs discernment. It needs grace in there. If you judge with a, 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 a strong dose of grace in your judging, evidence of life with a strong dose of grace, you won't make a lot of mistakes. If you're a young believer and you judge with a lot of pride and you're filled with spiritual pride and you've been reading a lot of books on living hard and holy lives, you're likely to make a lot of mistakes and hurt a lot of people. So we just need to go slow and cautious on this whole matter. Not be quick to judge, but also on the same token, don't throw judging out. Yep. All right. Here is a question that has been skipped several times, apparently, uh, probably not intentionally, most likely accidentally. How is it possible to develop a mental illness if you have the Holy Spirit sealing you? Hmm. Well, it comes down to the fact that we have fallen bodies. Amen. I was just teaching my children tonight in 1 Corinthians 15 on how this corruptible will put on incorruptible. And what that means is that we have a corrupted body that's subject to all sorts of illnesses. We know Christians that get Alzheimer's, right? Yep. And 
it's not saying they, they deserved it. It's just we live in fallen bodies. So mental illness could be a lot of things. It could be due to stress, having a mental breakdown, um, you know, could be prior, a uh, pre-salvation. You know, I know a lot of believers that lived apart from Christ and did a lot of drugs for so many years. And then they got saved. And then the effects of drugs weighed upon their physical body. And you just don't know the things that people go through. So that's right. It's very possible. Um, that's why our salvation is not on our merit. It's on Christ's merit alone. We're Amen. sealed until the day of redemption because of what Christ did on the cross, not on anything we did. And if we develop a mental illness later on, well, praise the Lord, we're going to look forward to the time when we're going to be freed from this fallen body and free in the arms of Christ. Yep, exactly. Amen. And I, I like to tell people, too, same kind of thought. Can, can your heart break down? Can your liver break down? Can your kidneys break down? Can your legs and arms break? I mean, well, yeah, all that stuff can break. Well, your brain can break, too. Mm -hmm. Your mind can break, too. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't stop you from having heart issues, kidney issues, or liver issues, except on a rare occasion when it is the will of God for the believer to be miraculously or providentially healed. They're not necessarily exactly the same. Um, but there are times when it is definitely, absolutely the, the will of God for a believer to be healed, and there's times when it's the will of God for the believer to just experience the curse and to be manifesting grace in the midst of suffering the curse. So the brain just belongs in the same category as everything else. Amen. Seeing that there was no commendation to Laodicea, and they appear to be false Christians, is it possible that the Laodiceans are going to go through the tribulation? Well, again, that comes back to proper her hermeneutics and, and uh, within its context, right? So we know that the church in Laodicea, um, and it, it, I, can, I can understand why people would get confused by this. He's writing to a church. And he's saying in verse 16 of Revelation chapter 3, So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Um, and then he goes on to say, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, jump down to verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know, Lee talked about the fact that if you're a true child of God, God's going to discipline you. In Hebrews, it talks about that. Hebrews chapter 12. If you're a true child of God, you're going to discipline your children. He says, therefore, be zealous and repent. Well, what, what do they need to repent of? Being lukewarm, being neither hot nor cold. Why? Because I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, I'd love to know, Lee, your, your take on this. Is this, are these verses talking to Christians or to false converts within the church? Well, both. And if they're false converts, then, then they're going to be left behind. Yeah. Well, all of the churches are going to have real believers and false believers. There's no yes. such thing as churches that are all 100% believers. And it's even in the Catholic church, there's scattered real believers. And folks, even in the Mormon church, there are people that just got saved. They haven't yet left the Mormon church. It might take them, same with the JWs, it might take them a few months or a couple years to come to the point where they come out. Um, so we have to be careful on that. But we're dealing with believing churches here. And when the Lord talks about removing their candlestick, this isn't everyone in the church losing their salvation. If the church has this candlestick removed, this is the Lord letting go of that church as a local testimony that he honors. He's rejecting that local church. Doesn't mean everyone's not saved. It just means there's too much problems in the church and that they're on a path where they're not going to repent. Even here in Laodicea, there, there was fake Christians and there was real Christians. Yeah. The, the testimony as a whole was lukewarm. The Lord the Lord wouldn't have spoken to them and addressed them the way he did if they were all unsaved. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe it's false theology, not extremely bad theology. It's just wrong. 
to look at it like the Laodicean church is the fake church that goes into the tribulation and the Philadelphia church is the real ones that get raptured. Um, we talk that way in a figurative way, and if people want to use the Laodicean Philadelphia uh, language, um, just understand that that you're borrowing Bible terms and you're using the principles from those passages, but that is not what those seven churches teach. Yeah, and just add add one thing. There's a lot of people, and I've seen comments on this on my YouTube page, that say uh, the Laodicean lukewarm church is not going in the rapture and that's completely false we have to we have to kind of expose that because what that is saying is that the rapture is conditioned upon your good works right that's right so the rapture is part of god's plan of salvation part of our glorification when we get our glorified bodies there's nothing we could do to earn a rapture it's just part of god's prophetic plan and so to to tie the rapture into some sort of works-based performance is just false theology. Yeah, if, if you are born again, you are going up in the rapture. It doesn't matter if you were just saved five seconds earlier, you're going up in the rapture. It doesn't matter if you've been backsliding. If you're born again, you are going up in the rapture. It doesn't matter if you are the most carnal born-again Christian that ever lived you're going up in the rapture. Mm -hmm. The only issue is, are you born again? Yep. That's that's what it comes down to. Um, and you are exactly right, brother. The rapture is part of the salvation package. When you get saved, you get justification, you get put on a path of progressive uh, sanctification, you get regeneration, which changes you from the inside out, and yep. you get the promise of glorification. Uh, you get all four pieces of the pie. Yep, and that's Romans 8. If you doubt what Leah's saying, go read Romans 8. It's progression. It's like you get this, you get this, and you get this. So, Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, we've had a great conversation. It went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but it's not uncommon for my shows to go somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours once we put the Q&A in there. Uh, brother, I have really enjoyed having you on. Um. I enjoyed your testimony, and wow, I, I'm just going to uh, close with a word of prayer here, and let's just pray that God will bless your ministry and use you in evangelism and discipleship. Praise the Lord. Father, I want to uh, pray that you would bless Brother Dustin and his uh, work through his ministries of Ripster and through um, Busy for Him. Uh, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would indeed encourage him, strengthen him, give him open doors, give him opportunities, help him, Lord, to be a fiery flame that cannot put out, to be a city on a hill that cannot be hid, to be filled with your spirit, to be filled with your word, to labor in your power and in your glory and in your grace. Lord, we pray that you would use him between now and the rapture call, and we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Well, I'm going to uh, close up this live stream here after a last minute encouragement to the believers. But if you wouldn't mind hanging out for another minute or two afterwards, that'd be great. Sure. All right, folks, I do want to thank you for showing up for the for the live stream. If you haven't yet followed Dustin's uh, YouTube channel, I would encourage you to do so. I know that we probably all follow way more channels than we could ever possibly watch all the videos that go out on them. I follow about 50 channels, and there's other, I don't even come close to watching all the videos on any one of those channels. But I follow those channels, folks, because I believe in those men and those ladies, and they're all doing a work for God, and I want to support them as far as I can, despite my busy schedule. So, folks, keep your eyes up. Keep looking up for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I often say in my messages and in my videos, eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire, and we'll see you next time.